What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, um, past guests. Haley, I always like to give a shout out to the Chicago-based companies too. Past guests include Ross Gordon, who is founder of Catch Co. and Mystery Tackle Box, which we'll definitely talk about. Uh, Spot Hero, I had on the podcast. Jeremy Smith, one of the co-founders, that was fantastic. Dan Zawacki started Lobstergram. He was shipping live lobsters in the mail in the 1980s um, and a few years ago sold his company. That and many more. Check out and check them out. Other episodes on inspiredinsider.com. Um, before I introduce today's guest, uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co founded with John Corcoran. We help businesses give to, and I like to say, Haley, connect to their best relationships. You know, um, by helping you launch and run your podcast. For me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. So I'm always looking at a way to give to and profile the people I admire, the people I love what they're doing and putting them front and center stage uh, in their company. And I've done that over since 2008 through podcasting. So you can check out rise25.com. If you or your company have thought about starting launching a podcast, we've been doing it for a long, long time. And, um, you know, before I introduce to you, Haley, I have to be give a big thank you to Leslie Cohn, who's principal at Hirschman Cohn. She helps companies who are raising money and she does so much more than that. When I was talking to Leslie, I didn't realize early on she has this fascinating experience um, that she helped companies going through IPOs like early on in her career. So it was fascinating to hear that. So you can check her out at Hirschco.com. And I'm excited. Haley Quaid Zolo uh, is principal at startingline.vc. They made investments in companies like Cameo, Catch Coach, I mentioned, Spot Hero, many more. And she was, you know, previously was working with Trunk Club and KPMG. So she's got a wide range of experience and all types of companies. So Haley, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Excited so, to, to be here. We'll talk about the journey, um, you know, how you got into Starting Line um, previously, but let's start with Starting Line. Um, people can check it sure. out, startingline.vc. Um, how did you meet Ezra and Aid? Yeah, so it's funny connection, actually. So a couple of different ways. The, the startup I was at most recently prior to Starting Line was called Mac and Mia. It was a clothing service for children. And one of our investors was Chicago Ventures, which was where Ezra was before starting Starting Line. So I kind of always knew him. I thought he had a really cool style. He was doing these awesome consumer deals. Spot Hero was actually a deal that he did while at Chicago Ventures. And I just really admired what he was doing. And I um, was just following him. So it's funny because my husband's actually an entrepreneur. He was at Grubhub and left uh, started his own company um, about five years ago. And he was networking within the Chicago VC ecosystem. Him and Ezra kind of hit it off. And then, you know, serendipitously, when I was at Mac and Mia, Ezra reached out to, to grab coffee and we had a conversation. He was trying to recruit me to go to Cameo, which was the deal he had just did. Um, and I kind of flipped the script on him and I said, hey, you know, I'm trying to see what this startup is, is going to do. I'm, I think it's a little bit premature, but love what you're doing. I think it's really awesome that you're starting a brand new VC here in Chicago with this consumer thesis and venture is always something that has been on my long-term roadmap. And I'm just curious, you know, what the job's like and wanting some exposure. So let me know how I can help you out. And we kind of left it at that. And he was really receptive. So for about five, six months, we were just exchanging emails. We were grabbing coffee. I was helping due diligence on the side. I met Ade, um, who was the first venture partner partner he brought on. And, um, you know, the, the Mac and Mia story was very winding, but it um, came to a situation where we um, sold the company and I was ready to make my next move. And I said, hey, Ezra, you're the first conversation I want to have and would love to be part of the starting line team. So came on board officially in the summer of 2019 and um, about a year and a half in, I'm like so blessed and so excited for where I've been and everything I'm learning and having a blast so far. So Haley, what did he want you doing at Cameo? 
So he was trying to recruit you. What did he want you to do? Yes. So this was, you know, back. And, and by the way, if anyone has not heard of Cameo, they should check it out. It's, it's amazing. It's terribly addictive, unfortunately. <laughs> so I will go on and I'm like, oh, you know, 30 minutes later, I'm looking through other celebrities. So, I mean, just mention a little bit what Cameo does and then maybe what did he want you to do there? Sure. Yeah. So it's a marketplace for, for celebrities um, and different influencers and personalities to give personalized shout outs to fans and to consumers. Um, so it's here in Chicago and it just had a crazy explosive trajectory. And this was early 2019 when we, you know, we reconnected Ezra and I, and they had just raised the seed round that starting line led. And the team was like 15 people. I think they were still like working out of the merch mart. And, you know, really the growth was exploding, right? They, they hit this kind of lightning in a bottle moment. So what they, what he was trying to pitch me on was building out their analytics team. So that's what I had built when I was at Trunk Club and then had done at Mac and Mia. So I love data. I can geek out on that all day long. And it was very flattering, right? That he was looking to me as, as someone who can potentially lead that within Cameo. Um, so that's what he pitched me on. So what if you were to go into Cameo at that, what would you do to start? So building out the analytics, what does that mean to like a lay person like me? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, starting to pay attention to the different data points that the business is starting to spit out. You know, when you're just getting going, you're kind of in this like executional mode and you're just like moving really quickly and making things happen. You're not necessarily analyzing the business or the data and thinking through strategy, but you hit a point when that becomes really important, right? There has to be some kind of holistic view in terms of how is the business performing? What are our KPIs? How are the different business functions like thinking about data and their decision-making? So yeah, you know, you can kind of hack it together in Excel and Google spreadsheets for a while, but then you hit a point where you kind of need to build some infrastructure. So you know, what I had done in my prior world was starting to, to build that out. So working really closely with data engineers and building out data warehouses and thinking through a data visualization platform, there's Tableau, there's Looker, there's a lot of different other tools out there. Um, so that's kind of up my wheelhouse, right, is how do you create data sets? How do you start, you know, running charts and reports and just paying attention to uh, what the trends are and making sure that the business is just optimizing for growth and everything else. Now with the companies, um, do they often turn to you for these, you know, companies to help them with that? Um, so they, you got the best of many worlds by having you on. <laughs> and now it's like, cool. Now you can just help with Cameo. You can help with, you know, all these other companies, Schoolhouse, Mave League. Is that, uh, what's your role, I guess? Yeah, no, thank you. That That is a lot of what we kind of pitch is that we're pretty hands-on investors, right? We like to be uh, strategic and feel like an extension of the team. So absolutely, that's something that we sell when we're trying to win the deal. And then when we actually get these companies into our portfolio, um, love going deep into their data sets and um, helping them kind of stand up some of these these processes and infrastructure. So yes, that's that's definitely something that we're doing all the time. So he still got you for Cameo. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, no, look- I mean, right when I started, yeah, I was I was hanging out with them all the time and, and kind of advising in that capacity. So they've come a long way. What are some of the key metrics that when you're talking to Cameo, um, they should be looking at? For that business specifically? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, there's, there's honestly so many ways to think about it. You know, one of the big things in that business, you know, it's a marketplace. So it's thinking through the, there's the supply and the demand, and there's a lot of different uh, dynamics that you have to think about when building up both sides of that. So on the supply side, what's really interesting is that um, they have this really unique situation where the supply is actually helping create a lot of the demand, right? Because they are already these influencers, they have a ton of following. So you know, each cameo is kind of like a walking billboard for, for the next. So in the analytics, it's, it's actually understanding, you know, who's driving on the supply side, a lot of their, uh, their cameo sales, right? Um, so thinking through, is there certain trends within the supply, within different categories, you know, like reality TV stars do really well. Um, so there's different ways to dissect that. And then on the consumer side, it's understanding, okay, well, where, 
where are the top customers coming from? How do you think about different acquisition channels? Um, and just being more thoughtful around, you know, how you're deploying marketing spend and stuff like that. Who are some of the popular uh, cameos, Haley? I think the Real Housewives are like the really? top people. Yeah. Wow. And I'm a really big Real Housewives of New York fan. Um, Bethany Frankel is like my girl. So <laughs> she, um, yeah, it's been really cool to see her like rep cameo and be one of the the top, the top, you know, people on the platform. That's a top category. What's one that's unexpected that you saw that uh, maybe category or person that was unexpectedly popular? Well, I think what's kind of been fascinating this year within COVID is that there's this whole like streaming phenomenon happening, right? With Netflix, where everyone's starting to jump on the bandwagon of all of these different shows, right? The second they come out. So looking back earlier this year, like Tiger King, that was like, right, such a rage. And immediately that all of the the characters, um, we're, we're on cameo, like within weeks of that blowing up. And, you know, those, those were all actually very, very top performers. Um, same thing with like cheer, which was like a docu series or documentary. Um, they, they all did very well on the platform too. So it's been, it's been fun to kind of see like the pop culture moments within some of these reality TV shows that people are binging, you know, they were, no one knew who these people were. And then instantly they become pretty, pretty famous and now have cameo to monetize that. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. I love to hear what the reach out is like, but if you go on cameo, check it out. I mean, there's featured, there's sports, there's, I mean, there's the, the who's who of any of these arenas are on there. There's comedians, there's creators. Like if you want, um, if you're an Andrew Dice Clay fan or a Chris Tucker fan, you could literally get a shout out to one of your friends or family members by going in there. I mean, pro wrestlers, political, it's, it's goes on and on. What's the reach out. I imagine like the, the breakdown of people coming to you, to them, I guess, and then them having to reach out. Yeah. I mean, I think at the beginning, you know, they didn't have a ton of the top names on the platform. So it was a lot of, you know, DMing on Instagram and just trying to get, you know, into these people's inboxes um, and sell them, you know, on the platform. And I think over time, as they become, you know, more of this household name and they have bigger personalities on the platform, it's been easier to get them to refer people in their networks and and kind of spread that way. We've also seen a ton of success with, um, you know, some of the top A-list people going on for a limited time to donate to charity. Um, So Cameo came out with uh, an org around like Cameo Cares, where they can actually donate all the proceeds to, to charities of their choice. So it's been cool. I think like Mandy Moore, Sarah Jessica Parker, um, Kristen Bell, you know, some of those really big names have gone on for a limited time for that purpose. Very cool. So fascinating, you know, and I want, you know, I was talking to Leslie Cohen and she was like, you need to have Haley on. She's super (laughs) impressive. And one of the things she said of the, the things you did with trunk club. So talk about your journey, what, you know, with trunk club a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I came to Trunk Club after spending um, like two and a half years at KPMG out of school. So my background was in accounting and finance. I got my CPA. Um, You know, I I love what I was doing at KPMG. I was I was learning a ton in terms of getting in the weeds of businesses and doing crazy analyses. But I got, you know, kind of burnt out. Right. And I was thinking through the startup ecosystem in Chicago and at the time, I, I literally stumbled upon the Trunk Club opportunity on Indeed.com. And it's kind of, you know, crazy thinking back to like that moment. But I, I, I came in, you know, their office is downtown in Chicago. They had an amazing, uh, just like cool office, right? There was um, a big bar and part of the experience, we did the trunks that were digital. Um, but we also had these clubhouses, right, where you can come in and work with a stylist. So our office was like also this really cool clubhouse. So I came in, I was just like enamored by the, the organization and the culture. And I was like, I just have to work here. So I came on as like the seventh hire on the whole finance team. So was able to immediately leverage, you know, everything I had you know done and learned at KPMG within like the financial lens. But quickly we spun out into a strategy and data analytics team. So kind of circling back to what I talked about before with building up, you know, data infrastructure that was a really big part of what we were doing. You know, the business was growing so quickly and 
we were doing everything in house, right? The way that e-commerce has evolved, you know, the modern D2C brands today, they can outsource a lot of things, right? There's 3PLs, there's Shopify, there's a lot of ways to plug and play into this ecosystem, but that didn't exist, you know, 10 plus years ago when, when Trunk Club initially launched. So one of the first projects I worked on was um, our warehouse analytics. So it's crazy, but the initial warehouse was also our office in, in the River North um, headquarters. I, you can see it, the, um, you could see it off of yeah, the, the exit. Sign. Yeah. 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 And that's where the original warehouse was. So I remember my first day I walk in and like get a tour and it's like aisles of like jeans and you know, the button downs and everything was like organized by category and size, but we outgrew that so quickly. So we had to go into a, a new uh, fulfillment center and we actually built a lot of technology around that because the, the processes that we built were rather unique to us at the time, right? The whole model was try before you buy. So about 90% of what went out the door actually came back and we had to know what the customer kept in order to charge them. So there it's was a, a logistical lot of really, nightmare. Really. Yeah, totally. Um, and a lot of data, right? Around like, okay, how do we make these processes more efficient? I, I think before we started thinking through or, you know, assessing what was going on, it was taking like, 15, 20 minutes to pack one trunk, which doesn't really scale, right? When you're growing like thousands a day, right? So that was a big thing we kind of thought about. It's like, okay, how do you put technology into place? How do you reduce that? I think we had, had reduced the time down to like five, six minutes. And, um, you know, from there, we kind of just evolved into almost like these internal consultants throughout the company. So once people got wind of like the, you know, the, ability to, to help scale on the warehouse side of things, every other team was like, oh my gosh, like we need analytics help, like come help us mm. out. So did a really big project for our customer service team. You know, again, business was scaling and we were getting all of these customer service cases, like where's my trunk and I need to book an appointment, you know, you name it. So helped really figure out, you know, how do you make those processes more efficient? How do we start, you know, staffing according to when these cases were coming in? And then we got acquired by Nordstrom about a year after I joined. So that was a whirlwind, kind of a dream. I grew up like obsessed with Nordstrom and it was just so fun to be able to partner, you know, with such a renowned brand. And um, a big project I worked on for about a year was launching women's. So Trunk Club started for just men and we got acquired and Nordstrom was like, hey, like, women's is like 80% of our business. And at the time, you know, Stitch Fix was kind of just getting started um, and they started for women. So clearly, you know, they were proving out that there was certainly a big market for the category and for the service. So we started that, you know, out of a Google doc, we were kind of just like figuring out, okay, like we have all these guys, do they have wives? Do they have partners? Do they have girlfriends? And quickly, you know, spun that out into a whole new, um, you know, part of the business. So it was really, really fun. To That's work a on big that. undertaking. Yeah. And I can't take all the credit, but it was um, kind of this like small, like cross-functional tiger team, you know, kind of felt like a startup in the startup. So worked, you know, across sales, across product, across engineering. Um, it was really hacky at first, to be honest, because, you know, we were leveraging Nordstrom inventory, but we had to, you know, turn it around and put it in a trunk club box and the systems weren't integrated yet. So learned a lot about behind the scenes around, you know, integration and inventory seeking. And um, it was just really, really fun. I feel like, you know, it's the non-sexy stuff that makes businesses run, which is like, once you analyze, you can create efficiencies in all of these departments. And it's pretty amazing. The results um, you talked about, I'd love to hear some of the KPIs you were looking at at trunk club, obviously, you know, if you're not even measuring it, you can't improve it, right? So um, saying, okay, we're packing these trunks, it's taking 15 minutes, how do we, and you, you know, decrease it to four or five minutes, it's amazing. What were some of the other KPIs that were important that you were measuring and then creating efficiencies around? Yeah, absolutely. So I can go into so many different ways to geek out on this stuff. A big one was honestly, um, like the stylist productivity. So you know, when I joined, we probably had like a hundred stylists. And then over time, you know, we grew up to 500 plus and actually across multiple offices. So the first office we, our clubhouse we opened was in Dallas. We had one in LA, we had New York, we had Boston, we had, I think Charlotte. Um, 
And there were a lot of, you know, analytics around, okay, well, based on where these stylists are, how are they, um, how does their productivity changing? We also had three different business lines. So you can send out trunks with clothing in a box. You can do an in-house appointment and have, you know, the customer come in on site, or you can do custom. We, we trained our stylists to do custom clothing. So that was a really big way that we analyzed the business was breaking it down into, you know, the segment, right. And then the location, um, and then through that, you can go even deeper, right, and see what is the average transaction value. Um, a big metric or big KPI for the box, for the trunk business, was called the keep rate. So out of a total box of items that went out, mm. let's say, 10 items, what percent of them actually got kept by the customer? And that was a really big KPI that we would focus on because, you know, the stylist had a lot of discretion in terms of what they were putting into their trunks, but we also had a lot of kind of augmented technology on the back end around recommendation engines. So the keep rate was a really big one that we focused on to make sure that, you know, the recommendation and algorithms that we were building were actually working. And, um, you know, the customer was keeping what we were recommending we should send them. I mean, ultimately that's, you know, you could probably rank the best stylist by the keep rate, I imagine. Sure. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. And there was a lot of, you know, training that we built around that, right? We built a very strong in-house training team around best practices. You know, when you onboard a new stylist, like what was their, what was their training guide, right? Um, how do we train them on the brands, right? That was a really big focus. Um, when we were just on the men's side, we were buying all of the inventory in-house. We were going out and we were curating these, these emerging brands. And then we got acquired by Nordstrom. We then had like so many more brands at our fingertips. So the brand education was a really big part. And then ultimately, you know, styling them. How do you actually put the outfits together? How do you storytell around these brands and communicate all of that to the consumer? It's pretty amazing. Do you remember any, so any of the other efficiencies that were created in the kind of logistical piece when you were fulfilling? So one obviously was the kind of the packing piece, what were some of the other efficiencies that you remember? Wow. We, you know, went from 15 minutes to five. What were some other ones? Yeah. A big one actually it was funny when we like discovered it was just like the time in between packing. So one big like initiative that we did was we, we instituted a pick by address system. So the whole warehouse was organized into like aisles of racks with letters and numbers and a coding system. So when a trunk was ready to get picked, it actually had this optimized like pick path to figure out, you know, where should you find all of the different items on the shelves? And then when you actually dropped it off to then get packed, I think we had initially had like pick up the new one to get started all the way in the back of the warehouse, which took like two to three minutes just to like walk back to. So we like flipped that and then saved, you know, a couple of minutes just by kind of reversing the pick path for the, for the subsequent one. Um, that was a big one. And then, on the return side, you know, what was really interesting, like I alluded to, you know, 90% of the items actually, or a oh, trunk came back, right, with at least one thing in it. So there was a lot that you had to do to actually inspect the items on the way back in before mm. you put them back on the shelf. So there was, you know, the kind of in-house little like refurbishing section, right, where you can, you know, fix any scuffs on the shoes. Um, we had a dry cleaner, we had a steamer there was a lot you had to do. So over time, you know, we kind of figured out how do you even optimize that because that doesn't scale, right? When you're trying to do that for every single item. So we had a lot of different ways of um, kind of testing different processes, number of people per station, what tech they needed um, and, and, and started just continuing to trim those times down too. I feel like Haley, if, if Trunk Couple could do that, literally they could do anything. I mean, that, that's like every <laughs> e-commerce business who's taking in returns, I don't care who you are, should probably look at what you are doing at Trunk Club because that's, it's almost, no one's going to keep 100% most likely of what you send them. So there's always going to be guaranteed a return, which in a normal business, you hope they return nothing, right? And most of the time there is a, a low return rate because of the business model. But what were some things that you decided, okay, we need to stop doing this because of the metrics. Like you mentioned, you know, there's a couple of ways people get styled. They can get sent a, a trunk, they can get come in, they can get custom. Was there anything in the business you're like, okay, you need to stop doing this. This is not 
good for the business in general. Not only we can't even make this more efficient, we just should stop doing it. What were some things on that realm? Yeah, a good example of that is so, you know, early days, the customer was getting a totally blind box, right? They didn't know what we were sending them until they physically opened it up. And we started learning that, okay, by previewing something ahead of time, we could actually increase our keep rate because they would have the option to like approve or deny certain items before it went out the door. You know, things like I already have that, or I hate the color green. I hate polka dots, whatever it is. Something you would Um, never know that was the case. Exactly. Right. So we rolled out something called trunk preview where the customer could physically see every single item in the box or in the trunk before it went out and, um, you know, X out certain ones that we shouldn't send them. I think there was something that we had done where there was like an expiration date or time window that you had to like interact with it. I think it was like 48 hours. And if you didn't interact with it, we just sent it to you. And I think that with that, you know, people like forgot that it was coming or they were like, I don't want any of this. And we were like, wait, why are we still sending it? We should just cancel it if they're not interacting with it. So that was something that we recognized, um, you know, we can kind of flip the, the logic around that and then kind of eliminate that. Cause totally your point, like the returns, if that came back, we called it a full return, right? They send everything back and that's pretty costly, right? Cause we're paying for the shipping on both sides. Very and costly. We also learn, you know, there's something called like a carrying cost, right? Of the inventory, you know, for the days that it's in the field. And on average, our cycle time was like 14 days, you know, of those items out before they came back to be sellable again. So we, we quickly learned, you know, different ways to reduce that. Yeah. I mean, you already paid people to pack it. Then you have to pay people to unpack it. And it's yeah. a lot of labor involved in that. Um, yeah. What are, I'm curious, you know, we talked before we hit record about, you know, the, the final deal and fun one, closing mm-hmm. fun two. Talk about the final deal in, in fun one. Yeah, so it's not announced yet, so I can't oh, it isn't. Okay. actually call it out by Got name, it. but it's a really cool um, something in the audio um, social network space. Okay. I'll leave it at that. All right. By the time it goes live, who knows? Maybe you would have announced it. Yeah. Um, and then you were saying how deals are very competitive right now. Why yeah. is that? Yeah, I mean, I think in the past year, what we've learned is with, you know, this whole pandemic is we're doing deals completely virtually, right? The walls are totally broken down. Um, You know, founders could line up so many meetings in the day with investors across the country. And I think the market just looks pretty different than it did prior to this, where, you know, we were hopping on planes, they were hopping on planes, and you just physically couldn't like have as many conversations as you could now. So I think with that, there's just been just a lot new, a lot of new opportunities, right. To just like have as many conversations as possible. And with that, I think the the market is getting more competitive because it doesn't matter where you're located. And if anything, I think it's like democratizing access, right. Which is very true to to our thesis of starting line um, within the 99%. But I think that there's um, just a lot more access to connect with investors in a way that wasn't available before. And with that, it's getting a lot more competitive. Another piece, I think, is just by the category that we're seeing competition because there are certain categories that have had headwinds or tailwinds, you know, with the with the pandemic. So there are certain categories, you know, like education, ed tech, that are completely exploding right now because there's just this complete like need state that is is very relevant right now. So I think you see um this kind of unbalance within the supply and demand of certain categories where the investors are all high conviction, high thesis in these categories. And there aren't as many, you know, earlier stage companies building into that at that moment. So it gets just hyper competitive in those situations where everyone's trying to fight over, you know, the the best deal in the category at that time. I want to highlight some of the companies, Haley, but first, so what do you look for in when you're investing in a company? Yeah, a lot of different things. I think first that we really prioritize is like the team, especially at the early stage. So we really specialize in the seed round. So typically the company has maybe raised a pre-seed or a small friends and family round. And then we come in and 
and typically lead or like to lead um, like a two to three million seed round and write a pretty large check into that round. So we look for, I think first and foremost, you know, why is this team positioned to build the winner in this category? What makes them special in terms of their unique insights or what did they do before this that um, has really primed them to, to build this company. So we care a lot about team, a lot about people. And that's been something we have to get comfortable with is like building those relationships totally virtually. So, you know, great that we have zoom that has just completely opened those doors, but um, that's a really big piece. I think second is we get really excited about completely new categories that are getting created. And I think thinking about them in terms of the timing around like, why now, right? I think that the, especially I, I focus a lot within uh, e-commerce and what's happening within the retail ecosystem. And there is just a complete acceleration to e-commerce right now, right? I think we've all probably seen the same charts around what has happened in the past 10 months that, you know, typically it taken 10 years to get that same kind of penetration. So we think a lot about timing and, and market and thinking through like, you know, why, why is this one, the one that's going to win? Right. I think if they're complete pioneers in the category that, that gives them a head start to be the first mover, but we also have to think about the kind of competitive landscape or tangential landscape, right. With other kind of like-minded companies that could creep into this space. So the, the competitive landscape is something we also pay a ton of attention to when we go through diligence, you know, scouring what else is out there and, you know, just making sure that we're not having any blind spots. And then you're the, you're the data analyzation metrics person. So what are you looking yeah. for? Cause if it's a new company, they may not have as many of the metrics that you'd like, or even right. know them. What are you looking for as far as metrics go for that company? Yeah. So it's a great question. It's something that, you know, I had to get comfortable, comfortable with because yes, in my prior world, you know, we had like overwhelming amounts of data, right? So we had endless ways to kind of slice and dice the business. And in very few cases at the stage that we invest in, is that the case, right? Sometimes the business hasn't even launched yet. Sometimes it's been around for a month. It's been around for a week. Um, so, you know, we don't pay too much attention to the metrics, to be honest. I think- You must cringe about- inside because of that. You're like, forget this company. They don't even know what they're, no, you know, you watch uh, whatever Shark Tank or something and yeah, the people who win know their numbers, right? And and um, so that, I, I can't, I can just see you cringing inside with, with A little that. bit. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the way that we kind of like spin it and what we typically ask for is still wanting to see a financial model, right? Still wanting to think through, you know, can they do a pro forma? And ultimately it's not even about like what those numbers look like, right? You can put- millions of dollars of growth in a spreadsheet all day long. But what we're thinking through is actually, does the founder, does the team actually understand the levers of their business? Do they know what their KPIs are? And do they understand like the sensitivity of those, right? If it's a direct to consumer business and they're forecasting their acquisition cost is gonna get very cheap over time, that's kind of a red flag, right? Because what we know very well is that the acquisition cost typically goes up over time and it gets more competitive and it gets harder to find the early adopters. And, you know, that can actually dramatically change that look of a business based on how much you're actually willing to put into marketing. So we love actually businesses that have a very strong organic strategy in terms of how are you going to acquire customers? How are they going to be word of mouth advocates for your brand and, um, you know, not rely on paid acquisition? Haley, who are some of the companies that you've worked really closely with um, at Starting Line? Yeah, so Cameo is one. Um, Made in Cookware is another big one. We we love them. They're down in Austin. They're a direct to consumer cookware brand, and they have actually had you know a pretty fantastic year because of the way that the category has has changed. Right, it's huge. We're not going everyone's out to cooking at home. Yeah, everyone's cooking at home. So. Yeah, they've been a really fun one um, just to kind of start getting in the weeds of, of their metrics and working with them. You know, a lot of what we do is we make strategic introductions. We, we try to help recruit, you know, different candidates. And 
you know, just advise in different capacities. You know, I've worked very closely with their head of operations, you know, as they're thinking through their growth and their scale and their supply chain, just given everything that I was doing at Trunk Club and kind of spoke to. Um, another one I worked pretty closely with over the summer was our investment in Schoolhouse, which is a micro school marketplace. And that was, you know, very timely. We were actually high conviction in micro schools well before COVID. But just given everything that happened over the past year, I know you mentioned your children have done remote learning. We, we saw firsthand, right, that there has to be, you know, an alternative. And there was a lot of craving both on the teacher side um, to be, you know, facilitating an in-person micro school, but also on the, the parent and the, and the children's side of things. So the business launched, you know, in over the summer and really was capitalizing on a lot of that demand. But it was such an early company, right? Nothing had processes yet. There was just so much to do. So I was getting very in the weeds, you know, in the Slack channels, you know, figuring out who to introduce them to on the acquisition side of things and, and building out, um, you know, some of the processes with them. So that what was do they do? a really fun one. What does Schoolhouse do? What? It's a micro school marketplace. So they connect teachers mm. to run in, in home or in house micro schools um, for students, typically about um, kindergarten through I think fifth grade is kind of our sweet spot. And the typically about like eight students per, per micro school. That's like the ideal business to start before a pandemic. Who would have known? Right. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Um, so schoolhouse, what's another one? I think you mentioned. That I've worked with. Closely. Yeah. Mavely. Mavely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mavely is another Chicago company and we found them uh, about a little over a year ago. I actually had read an article about them, I think in Glossy, which is a retail focused newsletter that I'm kind of obsessed with. And immediately we were like, we need to meet this team. Who are they? This is so cool. And um, moved very quickly, you know, to be partners with them. But they have built a, a marketplace, you know, of, of different direct to consumer brands. Something that, you know, fortunately Shopify has created is just there are so many brands within um, e commerce, D to C, everything, right? And I think there's a lot of fragmentation and there's a lot of, discovery that the customer is still looking for in terms of what brands, you know, should I be looking into? And one of their underlying theses is that the best referrals of new brands and new products come from people within your own network. So what they built is a way to actually incentivize people to share and talk about products and brands that they love with their friends and their family and people who follow them. So it's been a really fun one um, to be a part of phenomenal brands on the platform. And yeah, it's going really well. Haley, do you remember, you know, because you're giving a lot of advice to different founders, um, an example where one of them, you, you know, you probably give a lot of advice to people, but that one came back implemented and it was just a huge win for them based on something you had advised them on. It could have been on a checking a specific KPI and they came back, Haley, yeah, like we're actually tracking these numbers now or what do you remember getting feedback that your advice really, really helped? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm trying to reflect. Um, I mean, going back to what I said before around how we really get excited about organic acquisition, I think that's something that we're constantly kind of sharing as guidance to all of our portfolio companies is that the best customers are always going to come word of mouth. So that's something that we're really always um advising on because it is such an unlock. And we think that's a way to have, you know, like nonlinear growth, right? The paid acquisition game is, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope of, right? Just dumping money into these paid channels and like not knowing what's going to happen to acquisition costs, especially over the past year, it's been so volatile, right? The election comes in and changes it. The, you know, big players like pull out, they pull back in. There's just a ton of noise. So, we're constantly figuring out, you know, and advising to test new platforms, right? TikTok is one that has kind of been like wildly successful for some of these brands is to figure out how to hack that platform. You don't even have to pay for some of these sponsors. You just figure out how to tap into your customers and have them do a video or do something really interactive. And the way that that platform works, it just starts scaling, getting eyeballs um, really, really quickly. 
So I'd say that's probably one of the, the best examples of that is just figuring out, you know, alternative creative ways to, to acquire and, and grow customers. Yeah. You mentioned um, e-commerce, new categories, looking at new categories. What are some of the examples just so someone could visualize what you mean by like new categories and maybe some of the ones that, um, you know, uh, starting line has, what would be considered kind of like a new category? Cause by the time people hear about it, sometimes it's not a new category anymore. Like the early adopter is like, Oh, I've never heard of this, but most people probably hear about it and then they're thinking, oh yeah, it's not a new category. You're seeing truly new categories being created. Yeah, there's kind of two big themes, macro themes, I guess, that I've kind of been thinking through and ultimately I think these are gonna distill down into probably like subcategories. But a big one I think is just kind of the unbundling of the big social networks into these verticalized communities. So we recently made an investment in a company called Avia that is a, a smart birth control case that helps you track and take birth control at the same time every day, but also has an app that you can you know, track different things and has this whole community around it that's really powerful You know, with very young Gen Z women that aren't really getting this content anywhere else or haven't had you know, access to this education. So that was something I was you know, very bullish on. And it's a, a theme that we're continuing to see across other categories, right, where you take you know, subreddits, or you take these uh, communities and groups within Facebook, and there's whole businesses being built around them that are social communities. And I think they're only accelerating in this virtual world right now, mm. right, where you can start getting, you know, really building like meaningful relationships in a purely virtual world. Um, we haven't invested in this company, but I'm really good friends with the founder. It's a really cool social network called Upstream that is building a community for really like, you know, building a more serendipitous way to do networking uh, digitally. So there's constantly new hosts and there's new speakers and panels, but you go in and they have these 20 minute events and you just get to speed FaceTime with, with I think five, five different people for a couple of minutes each. And I've made so many amazing connections to that platform. And I think that's just one example of the way that networking and socialization is changing. So I'd say it's a pretty big category, but I start to see like different silos, right? Around maybe it's professional networking, maybe it's like, you know, healthcare, maybe it's fashion, maybe it's skincare, you name it. They're going to start getting a lot more verticalized. Um, another big trend I'm seeing is, and Mavely was, I think, a, a pioneer in the space, but the the whole pandemic has just really shifted the, the need state even more is that there are so many of these direct to consumer brands and ultimately they need distribution, right? It's very competitive for them to figure out how to acquire independent users to their like native website. So I think that my thesis is that there's going to be an emergence of these digital marketplaces where these retailers, it's kind of like the modern wholesale model, right? Department stores are kind of no longer a thing you know, except for a few of them. Mm. So instead of brands, you know, selling wholesale to department stores, there's now going to be these direct to consumer vertically native brands that are, you know, rev sharing or sharing their product um, across different digital marketplaces. So that's a big category that I'm paying attention to. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, that's kind of modern retail, right? Yeah, you go in, exactly. you discover what's on the showroom floor, and that's not happening now a lot with uh, COVID. And I love what you said about the kind of these vertical marketplaces. We see that with Peloton, right? I mean, there's these communities. I got like an aura ring. I know people are getting these swoop bands and now there's this whole education, but like this network of people around sleep hygiene or whatever. Right. So totally. this is happening across many different products. So I, yeah, I, I totally can see that. Yeah. I love that. Um, so Kelly, first of all, I want to thank you. I have, a, I have two last questions, but I want to point people towards everyone should check out startingline.vc. Check out what you have going on in the company. You have some amazing companies under starting line. Um, and are there any other places we should point people towards online to, to learn more about your companies or you? Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Check out our site. We have actually a whole kind of open source GitHub with a lot of transparency and writings that we like to be very upfront about. And then follow us all on Twitter. 
I'm at Haley Quaid Zolo and there's Ezra. I think he's Esmogi. Um, Ade, our venture partner. We also have a venture partner, Scott Holloway. So um, the team's awesome. You should just get to know us and and follow us on on Twitter and um, LinkedIn, any of the the big platforms we're all on. I want to hear, Haley, um, what's been a challenging point, um, maybe with one of the companies, career-wise, whatever it is, and then a high point. Um, but I also, I, I want to throw in there, you said your husband has a company. What's his company? So people can check that out yeah. also. Yeah, please. So he has two actually right now. One's kind of a side project, but um, first one is Collaborata. It's a market research marketplace for brands to share in the cost of market and consumer data projects with each other. So it's just at collaborata.com. And it. then he recently launched a new venture called Joe and Bella, joeandbella.com. And what he's building is a way to give uh, essentials to those at assisted living facilities. It's something that was very close to our family over the past year with his grandma who was in a home and it was very hard, you know, to pay attention to what she needed and what she was running out of. So what Joe and Bella does is we actually used to always joke when I was at Trunk Club, why isn't Trunk Club for Seniors exist? And there really has been such a lack of innovation in the, the category, um, you know, of technology for, for seniors. So he's building a way for these brands to have access um, to the platform and then caregivers can go in and and buy essentials and, and get them on a subscription to go directly to their loved ones at assisted living homes. I love it. Everyone check it out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what's been especially challenging time in the career? Cause if you look at, you know, your career, just this upward trajectory, I'm sure there's challenging points along the way. What's something you had to push through that was a challenge? Yeah. I mean, I think in the past year it's been, I guess a learning curve to figure out how to actually build and cultivate these relationships purely digitally. You know, it's something Ezra kind of always talks to me about and he reflects back on, you know, what he thinks propelled him early on in his venture career. And a lot of it is networking and it's these serendipitous moments, right? Where you go to a conference or you meet someone in an airport and you just spin up a conversation and that can't really happen right now. So I think the challenge has been, how do you, kind of figure out alternative ways, like the, the company upstream I mentioned has been a great resource for me during this time where it has allowed for these serendipitous connections to be made. But it certainly is a challenge. And it also, you know, on the one hand, it, it opens the doors, right? Because you can send a cold email, you can reach out to someone, you can grab virtual coffee. But I think everyone is a little bit Zoom fatigued right now. So it's easy to get lost, I think, in the noise of that. So you really have to, I think, go above and beyond to, to really make those meaningful relationships. Yeah. And then what about on the flip side? What's been maybe a high point of your career or something that sticks out as a proud moment? Yeah. I mean, I like to think that I'm never, I've never settling right for reaching that um but I think in the past year it's really just been getting to feel a little bit more comfortable in what this role is right I was very you know comfortable in the box business world between trunk club and Macania. that was five and a half years of operating in in the startup and speaking the KPIs inside and out and getting so familiar with those business models and venture you know has been a totally new learning curve for me there's um, like no rules, right? In this world, there's so many ways that you can spend your time and we're a very lean team. You know, it's just Ezra and I day to day. So there's so many ways that I can be spending my time. So I think a high has just been figuring out, you know, what my style is like, what are the categories that I'm getting the most excited about? How do I go deeper into those? How do I start getting more comfortable sending these cold emails and, you know, reaching out to a founder that is a total stranger and getting them excited about partnering with us and what we're building. Um, and I think that's been a high. I think I'm constantly learning and I'm not totally want to believe I'm ever going to reach that completely, but I'm, I'm getting a lot more comfortable doing that. So I think that's been a high for this year. Haley, everyone should check out startingline.vc and what companies should be reaching out right now to you? Ooh, 
Yeah, a couple of big themes that I'm super excited about. One, as has been a big thread, I think, about this is anything in next generation e-commerce. So anything in that space, new business models, new marketplaces, new platforms, and through the lens of personalization and sustainability. I'm very, very passionate about sustainability, specifically within retail. So anything anyone is building in that space um, would love to, to meet them. And same with personalization, you know, learn this world inside and out with Trunk Club and Mac and Mia, but I'm very bullish on personalization within a lot of different categories. So those are the big ones. Awesome. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, Jeremy. This was a lot of fun. Appreciate you bringing me on. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.